This is the Grow My Clinic podcast by Clinic Mastery, where we help you deliver amazing client experiences to grow your clinic. Well, welcome to another episode of the Grow My Clinic podcast. My name is Jack O'Brien, your host, and today we have a very special guest. James Shramko is joining us. Good afternoon, James. Hello, Jack. Welcome to the podcast. For those who haven't heard of James previously, James runs Superfast Business and is a, uh, a mentor and business coach for those uh, all around the world. Um, James is based in Australia and Sydney and has been an incredible uh, influence on myself and shaping how we lead our business here at Clinic Mastery and, and my clinic personally. Uh, James has recently released a book called Work Less, Make More. And so today we get to pick his brains and learn from him in and around what he's found to be effective to make more money, work less, have more freedom and, and create a fantastic business. So James, first of all, how was the process of of writing a book this is your first one what did you learn from the experience i learned that it's really hard to write a book <laughs> did you write it or did you have it go through it? i had a lot of help from a lady called kelly exeter it would not have happened without her because uh, i did try and write a book about five years ago and it was difficult then as well but kelly has a lot of persistence she suggested that i do a, a book she went through all of the previous book all of my products my podcasts she asked me a million questions i provided her audios for most which i had transcribed and then she turned them into what you see as that book as a sort of working draft i think we rewrote one whole chapter Mm -hmm. and and then i went through and just um, changed every single chapter for another two hours just to render it over with make sure that it's absolutely what I say and and how I think. So it was, if you like, it was based on my stuff that she constructed that I rendered. So it's it's a massive teamwork operation, but you know, she did a huge amount of work. And it's a case of recognizing when something may not happen unless you bring in someone from outside. And that applies to a lot of areas of our life, right down to food sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. So why would you write a book? Um, obviously, you're not in it to, uh, to make heaps of money off a a 15 to $20 uh, book, what was the purpose behind it? Uh, well, you can make a lot of money from a book, but not necessarily from the book sales. That's one thing that's actually surprised me. I didn't even think about that, but I have noticed that it's actually making quite a lot of money from the book sales. <laughs> uh, so that was a complete surprise. Uh, and I have a, a client of mine is selling a book like mine. He sells roughly twice as many copies as mine because he's been going for three or four years and he's doing a six-figure income just from the Amazon sales. So that aside, a book is a great way for people to find out about you and for you to introduce your core ideas. And what it will do is it'll generate sales of whatever else you have to sell and opportunities to come along and speak on a podcast like this, uh, to get invitations into certain events or uh, presentations and um, what I'm finding is it it helps conversions so people who already know you uh, re-engage and will also um, I guess they just they it moves them further down that marketing funnel without having any heavy heavy sales tactics because it's like hey anyone with a published book is obviously an expert and and has authority in the market that's the perception now rightly or wrongly it just is Mm -hmm. and it's taken me, well, more than a decade since I started online to publish the book, and I can notice a specific difference. Um, as soon as it came out, the sales of all of my products just lit up like um, they were on fire. It was amazing, the difference, the transformation. And the last time I experienced something like that would have been um, – when I joined Mercedes-Benz and I noticed the difference of the way that people react to you in the traffic if you have a really expensive car. Mm, Interesting. So you, touching on Mercedes-Benz there, for those who don't know your backstory, you cut your teeth in sales, moved into online marketing and now work exclusively with business owners? Yeah, my favorite customers are business owners, not enterprise companies. I like business owners. Um, I can really relate to them and I've learned so much about it um, having run businesses. And uh, it's super satisfying to help people go better. So I generally work with established businesses. I don't really want to focus on startups. 
I don't do venture capitals and floats and uh, weird stuff. I'm, it's just like show me an existing business that's going okay and I'll supercharge it. Yeah, fantastic. So the average listener to the Grow My Clinic podcast is a health professional who's turned business owner. Uh, they might be straddling the divide of still seeing clients face-to-face as well as leading their business. They might have looked at coming off the tools, but I think it's the title of your book obviously speaks to most of us. We'd all like to work a little bit less and, and make a little bit more. So let's jump into some of the key concepts in your book and, and see what we can glean off for the listener. Uh, you speak about effective hourly rate. Can you explain that concept a little bit more, why it's important to understand and then how we can look at leveraging it? Yeah, it, because we can measure time, it's something that we can do and then we can start comparing our activities and use this calculation as a way to score certain activities and see which ones are better than others uh, because later on in the book I explain that not all activities are equal. Right. The, the simple calculation is the amount of profit you have divided by the number of hours that you took to get it. Now, on a macro level, if you were still a health professional in a job, your wage would be your profit. And then you divide it by a number of hours that you work. That's pretty much your hourly wage. Sure. Now, most employees know what that is. Mm-hmm. Most business owners don't have a clue what that is. <laughs> Usually having a business or a small business means they're now working a lot more hours than when they're an employee they're working for a more difficult boss themselves and they also get the extra burden of everyone else's stress and hassle and you know government legislation and taxation requirements and uh, humans you know and, and customers and landlords and all this stuff so uh, what I suggest is that once we start calculating this we might calculate it by product line for example if I was a clinic owner I might look at how many hours am I practicing as the health professional versus how many hours I spend managing the business when the other uh, clinicians, I'm not sure what you call them, technicians. Mm-hmm. Clinicians is a uh, word, yeah. Clinicians, when they're practicing. Um, you might find out that you're actually making similar money in both cases, and in which case you could stop actually doing the, the clinician work. You could step back and actually just hire more people to do that stuff. The goal, of course, is to focus on the highest return activities possible. You might actually introduce a recurring subscription program to your clinic. Perhaps you could develop information products or a service that supports whatever it is that you're helping people with in the practice. And you might find that for every hour or two you spend on that, that it is far more profitable than the actual practice itself. And then you start to span a bit more into my world, which is where physical stores have started to go more online. You saw that with travel agencies where we stopped going into the travel agent's store and now we just look up stuff online and start booking. And we also seen that even with things like cars, uh, shoes, Zappos was a huge shoe company that sold for a billion dollars to Amazon. But a lot of health companies are pretty savvy and they're starting to combine their online stuff. And there's sort of a blurred line now between in the store and online. And, you know, we even order TVs and stuff online when we used to go into Harvey Norman. So that's the shift. And by using this metric, we can start to identify where our best return will come from. I think it's a really important point, especially in the health industry where typically it's bricks and mortar clinics and you need to be face-to-face and often hands-on with clients. Um, The nature of healthcare is changing and the tools at our disposal. I mean, we can now do consults online and it massively decreases your your overheads in terms of rent and other expenses. In our clinic, personally, we're starting to leverage tools like PhysiTrack, which is one of our partners, and really exploring the, the telehealth space. So so that effective hourly rate essentially is looking at each of the different activities you do in your business and spending more time on the ones that have a better hourly rate. That's essentially the premise. Yeah. And you might even have components of what it is that you do. Like I'm thinking of examples where some medical experts will have you go off and do a blood test at pathology, which might be in a different location. Yes. So you could go and visit a pathology place in you know near the customer then they can log online and get the results interpreted for them so 
there is this um, ability for you to think about how you might run your business differently. And certainly in my world, a lot of people who had, had a physical shop are now finding they can run virtually and they don't have to have that hassle. Mm, fascinating. Another one of the concepts that really spoke to me, um, it's its uh, meant massive shifts in my life in the last couple of weeks after reading it, was the concept of 64-4 focus and some of the little, uh, I guess you'd call them hacks in and around bumpers and purging. Can you explain 64-4 and how people can improve their effectiveness? So not all tasks are equal. A lot of the things that you're doing are not actually helping you. What that means is that you could stop doing some things and have no negative impact, except maybe you get a positive impact that you're now not as busy, which is the whole premise of work less and make more. The 64-4 is simply this, that 64% of your results are coming from 4% of your inputs. If you had 10 different clinicians working for you, I'm willing to bet that one of them would outperform all the others and one of them would be terrible and soaking up a whole lot of your time and energy. And it's tempting as the owner of a business to spend a lot of your time on the worst performer trying to lift them up. Instead, we might use this principle to think, well, we should just not spend our time and energy on the worst <coughs> performer. Let's drop them off the bus and let's train the others on how to do whatever it is that the top clinician's doing. Let's benchmark off their performance and see if we can lift the bar for everybody. So that's similar to the 80-20 rule that we might have heard of. It's exactly the same rule, but it's uh, that rule is fractal, which means that it applies to itself over and over again. So when I was inspired by the 80-20, I was reading Kosh's book about it, and then Perry Marshall wrote a book about it, and it was in the four-hour work week. And uh, Kosh mentioned that it's fractal. Mm -hmm. And this is when I realized that you can apply it to itself. So if you 80-20, the top 20% of activities, you find out that 4% uh, of the activities are responsible for 64% of your outcomes. In other words, 4% of the things that you're doing are getting you almost two thirds of your results. Yeah, wow. So if you strip away all the stuff that doesn't matter, you're left with only the important stuff. Fantastic. It's fascinating, isn't it? Four percent of what we do. It's fascinating. Now, if you if you don't believe me, then you could think about your favorite T-shirt or your favorite pair of shoes. Probably you have ten T-shirts, and I bet you there's one or two that you gravitate towards all the time, and there's some that never get a look in. And it it might be the same for um, for meals or plates or bowls or cups. Sure. You're probably you know using some all the time and other ones hardly ever. And that just applies to most things. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And I guess the the application of that is to do an audit of how you spend your time really, and and look at being doing more of what makes the most impact. Uh, so is that how you look at things like managing your inbox, tracking your time, eating, sleeping, those sorts of things? Yes, I like to try and find a pattern of what's actually important. It's like the, the keys on your keyboard. Some of them you get used a lot, some hardly ever. So, uh, yes, inbox is an interesting one. It's like the black hole of productivity. It's where <laughs> people get lost for five or six hours a day. And this is because an inbox is a to-do list that other people get to add things to. So you have to be very careful who you let come into your inbox. And I have quite a few strategies on dealing with that. One of them is to set up a support center away from your inbox you shouldn't be dealing with support in your inbox and the second thing is if something doesn't require action then it doesn't need to be appearing for you as a, an email that you have to read the only things you should be reading are things that require your action now that's it it's interesting so let's go a little bit more specific on that in health clinics we're getting inquiries from all over the place or customer service requests around specific health conditions how do you train a an admin staff or a support desk to be able to handle technical questions so you set up a support desk something like help scout which is very email like so from a customer's perspective if they sent an email to support at you know amazingclinic.com.au mm -hmm. That's going to generate a help desk instance and anyone in the company who's got usernames or logins can log in and see that ticket. Mm -hmm. You can allocate it by specialty or you could just share one. It's what we do in our business. Um, when you have someone new, you train them. You could actually go through the tickets with them and you could do the um, I, we, you method, which is in the beginning, it's like I will answer this ticket 
and then you move to we. We'll answer this ticket together, and then you do the you. Now, you answer the ticket. Uh, while you're training, uh, it would be a good idea to build out your knowledge base. So some of these ticket systems, you can actually create automated responses, okay. or you can have a library of responses. So uh, can you give me an example of a type of clinic that might be a customer? Uh, so let's say physiotherapy clinics fielding a question from a client around back pain and if physio can help back pain. Right. So let's say someone asks, can physio help back pain? The person operating the help desk will will search for back pain and up will pop a pre-done response, which might say, you know, can physio help back pain? And the, the pre-done response might be, uh, um, thank you for your inquiry. Uh, we're very pleased to confirm that, uh, you know, in 86% of cases, physiotherapy can greatly assist back pain. Here's a link to a case study of uh, a client who came to us for back pain, and you could link them to a video on a website. You could say uh, the next step for you is to book a consultation with our such and such representative, Sheila Brown, and if you'd like that uh, to go ahead, please use this scheduler or whatever, or, or phone the office or reply to this email. And they can pull that response into the current inquiry and they can just customize it a bit, put in the customer's name or change something if it's appropriate, and then they can hit submit. So now you're starting to leverage something that happens over and over again. Sure. But you also, as the business owner, you get to control the messaging because, as you know, the brand is baked into everything. And if you're after a really good customer experience, you want to have a consistent voice and tone and you'd like to know that no matter which receptionist is on that day, they're going to have a high-level response that you feel good about as the business owner instead of, um, you know, they're chewing gum and they're busy chatting to their boyfriend on Snapchat and they just let the phone ring out <laughs> or whatever. You need to remove those sort of situations from your business and this is how you start to systemize it. And the business owner can log into the system and look at all of the support queries. So now it's not in some private little email fiefdom off to the side where you never get to find out how your staff are communicating with the customer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's the sort of work I guess you're getting at with the 64.4 is spend the time getting those responses or building out that support library so that it's done once and it's leverage time after that. Exactly right. Um, can you talk into some focus a bit more? When we look at clinic owners, they're straddling that client work versus working on the business, um, managing their time, prioritizing their time, um, You know, getting distracted. There's all these shiny balls. What are your thoughts uh, on business owners chasing the shiny objects? Well, I like to set 12-week review periods. So if a bright, shiny object comes along, you just put it aside until your review period because it's not so far away that, that it can wait. I know as a business owner, you're getting approached by every marketer under the sun. You know, do you want to buy sign writing, business cards, printing, telecommunications, printers, computers, all this stuff? You can just say, thanks very much. Uh, we will review this on the you know, 1st of June and we'll just put it to the side. So basically put it in a later on file and you've got a review date where you'll pull that file out and look at everything that's in it. So if you know what you're doing over the next 12 weeks, nothing will get in your way. It's like a horse with blinkers or like a train on train tracks. You're not taking a left or a right turn because you know exactly where you're going, but you will review it at the next station. Mm, okay. So how do you how do you stay focused? Do you have a set routine through the week? Um, do you have any tricks with phones or obviously you don't check your inbox all that often? Uh, I don't mind checking my inbox because there's not that much coming into it and that's, you know, the su support's handled by the team and I haven't gone and subscribed to a thousand different marketers to see what they're doing. I don't care what they're doing. <laughs> I care what I'm doing. Uh, the thing is, yes, I have definitely got a routine. I block time on certain days of the week to do external activities like phone calls or podcasts. So that's when I'm servicing my high-level clients or doing marketing-related activities. The other days, uh, which will typically be uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, they're my days to do whatever I want. And I still have a bit of a routine on those days, but I don't have any pre-done appointments and I'm totally flexible. But every single Tuesday, I have two calls for my mastermind group. And on Wednesday and occasionally on Thursdays, 
I'm going to do some external calls. It just depends if I've got a lot of coaching clients at the, at the time, but usually it's just Wednesdays, mm -hmm. and then I get the other five days off for myself. Which is brilliant, um, and I think that's a mindset that a lot of clinic owners struggle to get around. Being a health professional, you're often very empathetic and caring and put other ne others' needs in front of your own. Uh, so I'd love you to talk about your concept of no compromise and how you're able to set up a lifestyle like that where you're still servicing clients and getting amazing outcomes for them, but not at the cost of your family or your lifestyle. Well, I can speak to this because one of my bosses once accused me of caring too much. You know, I'm very empathetic and I care a lot about my customers' results, but I don't think I can serve them very well if I'm tired uh, there's a lot of research to suggest that most mistakes are made because people aren't getting enough sleep. Right. I want to be at my best when I'm dealing with a client. I want to be sharp instead of blunt. And to do that, I need to recuperate. I need to have time away from my device. I, I don't want to be working more than 20 hours a week on my computer or in my business. I need downtime. I go surfing every day because it's soulful and it's a good physical activity and it's challenging and it keeps me feeling youthful. I believe that it's just redefining, you know, what it means to help people. Sure. If you want to grow your business stronger and make a fantastic service offering, you'll need to have some time to work on yourself and to be strong to deal with all the challenges and the energy that's required to run your business. And then you can serve more people. Sure. I'm serving more people now than I've served in previous iterations of my business, even though I'm working less than I've ever worked because I've been able to put in place good systems and I've been able to have products that actually work for my customers. And to do that, I need it set up the way that, that it has to be set up. I love it. I think I would help more people if I was surfing every day too. <laughs> sounds... I think everyone, if everyone surfed every day, and I, I hope they don't because it would be a pretty crowded lineup, but... <laughs> If, if everybody surfed, there'd be a lot less road rage and anger. And I mean, the fact is you're already behind the eight ball. If, if you wake up in the morning early and then you put on a uniform and hop in your car and drive into the clinic, like as far as I'm concerned, your day's already completely ruined. <laughs> You've just driven away from your house and your family and, and uh, your, your Netflix and your surfboard and all the things that, that are awesome in life. Yeah. It would be great if you don't have to do that. And this is the this is the message. You don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. I know people who run studios in other states or other countries remotely, real businesses with physical locations, with actual staff, but you don't have to be in there. That's a choice. And just know that. If yeah. you're in there and you think that's the only option, then I, I challenge you to, to rethink that. And that probably is not going to make me many friends, but I was that guy. I was the one working 70 hours a week in a physical location for someone else's business while I built my business on the side. Wow. And I ne never forget the, the realization I had when at one point my home business that I started from scratch on a laptop was making more profit than the car dealership that I was working for. And I had the same number of staff, but I was making more profit and I was running it from my home on a laptop. And the, the amount of leverage that's available to you has never been available to us before. Like we're in a, a new era. Yeah, I 100% agree, James. I, I think because health professionals are so stuck in the mindset that you need to be face-to-face -face and hands-on, when they shift hats and become the business owner, they think they need to be hands-on and physically present. I know that um, Daniel Gibbs, one of the team here at Clinic Mastery, his uh, his passion was to be able to see the sun in the middle of the day. As clinic owners, we're, or as clinicians, we're often stuck in four white walls. And as I came to the realisation, that's where we send prisoners. That's a jail cell when you're locked in four white walls. Yeah. So Next get, thing you know, they'll the be sun. wearing... Crocs and brightly coloured glasses inside the theatre so that they can have some personality or stand out. I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's like the end of it's it, the end of the world as far as I'm concerned. It, it speaks to leverage too. I know for me, uh, so we now have five clinic locations. I spend half a day a week at one of my clinics. The other four I don't visit and one of them I get to half a day a week. And I've found two things that I, I get more done in a focused period of time when I'm in my home office with no distractions, 
locked in for a block of time and then I can spend time with my family through the middle of the day. And number two, my team gets so much more done when I'm not around because the blockage is removed and we're forced to improve systems. Right. Now, if, if anyone's ever owned an investment property, you already know that you can have um, a paper return from a physical thing that you don't have to go and occupy. Mm. It's, it's magic. It really is. But it's a mindset shift that a lot of clinic owners need to get around. And I think in clinics and also in your business, you're able to do what you do because you're working off a results-based model. Now, this is going to be fun. This will be a little can of worms because a, a results-based uh, recurring revenue type model in the health profession is a little bit voodoo. So if you don't mind, can you speak to the benefits of a, a membership recurring model type of business? Well, recurring doesn't have to be a membership. It could be just a, a subscription of any kind. It could be a affiliate income that's coming from referring people to a service or a product that is good for them. For example, if you were uh, if you're helping people with their bad backs, maybe you found a device that people could wear as a neck collar or something that that you don't want to stock in your office, but you'd like to send people to go and buy somewhere else, and you'd get a commission if mm -hmm. they buy it. Some companies have services that pay recurring commissions, like insurance, for example, might be that situation. You we all know about insurance brokers. But there are other other services too. Uh, so in my market, there, you know, every one of my customers needs a website, hosting, autoresponders, email, email systems, and software. And if I refer people to those, I can earn a commission. So that's a good affiliate income. So basically, a commission only salesperson. Yeah. There are other things too. Yes, you could have memberships. If you had a yoga studio, for example. Uh, you could actually start telecasting your yoga lessons for people who can't make it into the studio and you could charge people a monthly subscription for that where they pay like $7 a month or $17 a month to tune in and get, you know, be virtual in class live with the instructor and they could even be popped up on the, the screen and interacting with the studio. Now, I know some people who have taken that model to the point where they close their studio and they just set up a little home office with a, a camera. Right. And, and then there's, um, there's other ones where you could have a customer on a retainer. Maybe they'd rather just pay a monthly fee and drop by every now and then. Uh, gee, I don't know, like a gymnasium <laughs> where you pay a fee and you can come and use the equipment or, or the facilities whenever you feel like it. We just look to other industries and see how does this work. Um, there are still other methods too. Maybe people can buy a 10-pack where they, get, uh, they pay up front but they get 10 uh, cards that can get stamped over time instead of just a one-by-one -one basis. Mm -hmm. And what we really want to do is start to disassociate ourselves from billing by time. But if we do sell time, it's the important thing here is to hire other people to deliver on the time. And I ran my online business, actually employed over 60 people a few years ago, and we had a very human labor-intensive product. But I hired these people to do the work and then I resold that labor at higher rates to make a margin. So yeah, it would be sense. good if you could have a supplemental income. But even if you take your income from the business and start investing it into things that will give you a return, that's another way that you can start building wealth beyond just the business that you're in. Mm -hmm. Makes perfect sense. And I think whether you look to a membership model or recurring revenue, essentially, and if you're stuck in the, the time for dollars exchange, where a lot of clinics are in terms of appointments, it's it's one session per session per session. Uh, that's where the lifetime value of a customer and retention comes into play, right? It's, it's far easier to retain a current client than pay for a new one. It's absolutely critical that you start building your systems to bring people back to your clinic where you have uh, reminders, alerts, messages, um, put them into a Facebook group or page where you can continue to communicate with them and that's where you can promote things and let them know about seasonal offers where you can uh, um, have new products launched within that arena so that you've got a warm audience and then you can start targeting people who are just like your customer but not your actual customer using some of the technology available uh, with the marketing platforms out there. Yeah, there's so much technology and I think um, you mentioned Facebook and keeping in touch and essentially you, you're reminding your clients of the uh, 
uh, of the value that you can provide, that leads us towards own the race course and content creation. Uh, in the health space, um, obviously, people are Googling constantly, right? They're always looking around and looking for answers online. Uh, can you uh, speak to how we can begin to create content and where that should be hosted, where that should lead to? Well, you just take the questions that people ask you and you answer them, but you could make a video or an audio so or <laughs> an article. It's actually really simple. <laughs> this is the main marketing that I've used for the last 10 years, just answering the questions that your audience already has. Right. And then you're showing that you not only understand them, but you also possess the solution. So it starts to build up trust. So, so when I'm making audio podcasts, people can listen to that when they're on a bus or walking the dog or at the gym and they can get a feel for who you are and and what you sound like and if they believe what you're saying and if they trust you and they can keep listening and getting great value before they ever buy anything. You're actually helping them get a result before they even buy something. So you're lowering that barrier of risk for them to take the next step. So I'm a huge fan of content marketing, but it's great because it serves three different audiences. It's helpful for prospects who might be interested in learning about what it is that you actually sell or you know what problems you solve. It's also helpful for existing customers. I'm sure if you've become a customer of a clinic, you'd like to stay in the loop or get updated like we get uh, the Motoring Association magazine, you know, what the new cars are or the new road rules. We're already a member, but they're keeping us updated. Or the same with American Express, they keep sending a magazine. And then the third group of people who used to deal with you but stopped coming for whatever reason, maybe they forgot or they got busy, this would be like uh, the dentist. We tend not to want to go back to the dentist. No one wants to go to but the dentist. But if they keep sending information or about a, a new painless tooth surgery or uh, you know this uh, uh, ultra light that doesn't involve drills or whatever, that might bring some people back who were putting it off but think, okay, now it's safe to go back in the water. Yeah, I think content marketing is fantastic. I'm a huge fan. Uh, our mutual friend Chris Marr has helped me incredibly with the Content Marketing Academy. But can you speak to the mindset a little bit more of, of a health professional who has all this wisdom and knowledge expertise, but they they might be afraid or nervous to put it out in public. They think they might not be good on video, don't have a great voice for audio. How do you get over that? <laughs> It didn't stop me. <laughs> <laughs> you got a great, you've um, got a great head for podcasts, James. <laughs> I hate the sound of my own voice. So I put off doing audio because I don't like my voice and I didn't think I had anything particular. But then I realized the uh, <laughs> this is the fundamental thing that should help anybody. When you first start publishing stuff, nobody's going to see it anyway. <laughs> you, you won't really have an audience. It's true. So there's, there's no one to throw stones or criticize it because you usually start off in a bit of a vacuum and it will take a while until you get traction. And some people give up too early. But just start. Or if you're really worried about it, just have someone in the team do it or hire a voiceover professional. You can go online to these sites where you can hire people to read stuff in whatever accent you want. <laughs> you can have other people write the information. So there's actually no part of it that you have to do yourself. Mm -hmm. If you wanted, you could hire a documentary crew to come uh, and go and chase down your best customers and go and film them and put together a video show reel and you're not even involved in it. You could hire people to write, record, publish and promote the stuff without you lifting a finger. Mm -hmm. So the key message there is there's really no excuse, right? The only excuse I can think of is if you've, uh, still sorting out things that are making you too busy or if you just don't want to to go better in business, maybe you're scared of what success might look like. It, it could be confronting. It's, it's, most people aren't prepared for such a profound abundance of time and money if you've been struggling for both of those for a long time. I know it was a big change for me. Like you do have to pinch yourself sometimes. Like I literally get five days off a week and I'm surfing, but my business still makes six figures a month. Sure. And sometimes I just think, wow, you know, this is just incredible. Yeah, it not really not is amazing. Six figures, but you're helping what, hundreds, probably thousands of business owners. Oh, most definitely. Like every single month, there'll be 65,000 downloads of my podcast. So someone's listening to it mm -hmm. and, Hopefully, it's helping a few of those people, and I don't mind serving that audience, and some of them buy stuff, and it's very easy. Like Just to put that in perspective, what I have to do for that is record one hour of content per week, 
at, you know, or even 25 minutes or half an hour. That's my involvement. Mm. And usually that's someone arriving in my scheduler and we're having a conversation and recording it. And when we hang up, I drag that audio into uh, a folder for my team online and they go and do the rest. So if I can keep doing that 25 minutes to an hour per week of content creation, that will continue the marketing machine that drives my business. I think that's pretty amazing leverage. I 100% agree. Uh, I've got into the habit of recording videos once a month. That that lasts us another month or two and it's always in the can. And uh, it, It's a long tail. It's evergreen, right? I know that uh, I've been following you for a couple of years now, two or three years, but I only became a paying client within the last six months or so. So that content that you produced two or three years ago is still reaping rewards now and the same can be said in health clinics right some people have actually taken eight years between (laughs) when they first heard of me until they became a customer Uh, and that just speaks to you know different buying cycles and you know that saying when the when the student is ready the teacher appears like if you just keep producing stuff at some point people uh, will just just reach that tipping point if they're ever going to be a customer. They'll just say, oh, gosh, you know, like some people have already made so much money before they spend it a dollar with me, and I'm okay with that. There was one guy who was selling e-books. I think he was making like $25,000 or $30,000 a year, and he followed my free stuff to get him up to about $450,000 a year, and then he joined. <laughs> and uh, it was all out of profit, you know, and, and now – He's on his way to a million dollars a year. And I love working with people at that level because they're go-getters and they're already proven and established. But in their mind, I'm already proven and established too because I create the content in the first place. Absolutely. It's that authority and um, brand recognition. So I love it. Mate, uh, we're going to work towards wrapping up. Is there anything else you can add towards the, the mindset or strategies that health clinic owners should be thinking about in order to leverage their time more, make more money and be more uh, efficient with their, their working week? My main tip would be look outside your industry because in most industries, they're all doing the same stuff. And in my position, I get to work with all different industries and I can quite often take one thing from one industry and apply it to another and it works really well. I learned this from Jay Abraham and you know, just cross-pollinating best practice is good. So next time you book a hotel or you buy flowers at the local shopping centre or you, know, you service your car, pay attention to the process and see did they do something interesting or different that you might be able to put into your clinic. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Mate, we really appreciate your time. If people want to find your book or find out more about yourself and Superfast Business, where should they head to? Uh, please head over to superfastbusiness.com forward slash book and you'll be able to find out uh, where the, the nearest bookseller to you would be. It's fantastic and I'd highly recommend the book. It has been a brilliant read and really challenged my mindset and us here at Clinic Mastery. James, thank you for your time. If you're listening and you'd like to find the show notes to this episode, you can head to www.clinicmastery.com forward slash podcast. Look for the episode with James Shramko. It's spelt as it sounds. Fantastic last name that is. And uh, we really appreciate any honest reviews and ratings in iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you might be listening to this episode. Thanks for joining us on the Grow My Clinic podcast. We'll be with you for another episode really soon. This is the Grow My Clinic podcast by Clinic Mastery, where we help you deliver amazing client experiences to grow your clinic. 